For decades, the number of hungry people had been declining. This isn't true anymore. Today, achieving the zero hunger goal by 2030 is becoming more challenging. More than 820 million people still do not have enough to eat. Hunger is increasing in many countries where economic growth is lagging, particularly in middle-income countries. Rising unemployment and declining wages and incomes are challenging people's access to nutritious foods and essential services such as healthcare. Income inequality is rising in many of the countries where hunger is on the rise, making it even more difficult for the poor to cope with economic slowdowns. Conflict and climate change are also driving hunger. Unless greater investments and more targeted efforts are made to address these drivers, we will not meet the goal of ending hunger. The Zero Hunger Goal is not simply to eradicate hunger, but to ensure that all people have access to safe, nutritious and sufficient food and to end all forms of malnutrition. This year's State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World 2019 report goes beyond hunger. For the first time, it provides estimates of the people who face uncertainties about obtaining food, the moderately food insecure. Today, over 2 billion people do not have regular access to safe, nutritious and sufficient food, a problem that affects people not only in low and middle income countries, but also in high income countries. The chances of being food insecure are higher for women than men in every continent, with the largest gap in Latin America. Too many children suffer from low birth weight or stunted growth. At the same time, no region is exempt from the epidemic of overweight and obesity. Overweight and obesity have increased in all regions, particularly among school-aged children and adults. But obesity is not the opposite of hunger. They can actually be linked. There are many reasons for this. First, fresh nutritious foods are often more costly and less available than highly processed foods, high in fats and sugars. Another reason is that the stress of living with uncertain access to food and food restrictions can cause physiological changes that increase the risk of overweight and obesity. And lastly, a malnourished child has a higher risk of obesity later in life. There are other repercussions of malnutrition. The economic costs of malnutrition are staggering. Obesity alone could cost 2 trillion US dollars annually in lost economic productivity and healthcare costs worldwide. And undernutrition would reduce gross domestic product by up to 11% in Africa and Asia. Our food systems are broken, and unless bolder actions are taken soon, humanity is at grave risk of seeing a continued rise in rates of hunger, obesity, and diet-related chronic diseases. To fix our food system, we must work together. Our actions must be focused on collaboration, stretching across borders from agriculture, food, health and water, to education, social protection and economic policies. Countries need to integrate food security and nutrition into broader efforts to reduce poverty and gender inequalities. Ending hunger and all forms of malnutrition by 2030 is an immense challenge, but with real political commitment, bolder actions and the right investments, zero hunger is still achievable. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is Nam Jun Cho again, and then uh, welcome back to uh, Asia Korea Conference 2020. And then uh, we had a, a very good uh, talk, and then uh, a lot of people right now joining in the uh, through the Zoom and then on site. And this is Asia Korea Conference on Science and Technology. The topic is human health and longevity in the post COVID 19 era, and especially this special discussion panel session, we invite the two very prestigious uh, speakers, Dr. Dean Boley, which is, he started his career in the Professor Kona University, Department of Animal Science, before moving to the private industry. So he's in the both industry and academia. He served as a technical director, nutrition leader for the uh, Honor Company, for over 15 years, uh, where he manages over 2 million pig annually. And then as you people know, we have a big problem in Asia for the swine flu and so on. 
and the 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 he currently maintained the adjunct professorship at Iowa State University, North Carolina State University. He won the numerous international awards, served on top of the advisory committee, including the Gay Foundation, some of the most recent work focus on evaluating research innovation in North America pig industry. And the other speaker, Charles Illovid, is a founder and president of Natural Biology, a product development and innovative innovation company focused on helping the solution of animal health challenges. He completed PhD in protein nutrition and facility at Kona University, where he has been actively member of the local community. And then he has been involved in cutting edge work across the academic, private, and public sector. He has drafted New York State Health Assurance Program, served as a member of Cornell University Extension faculty. Over nearly 20 years, he worked as a nutrition consultant at R&D for the daily division of the animal health company. And the he current role is a uh, uh, natural biologic. He also adjunct assistant professor animal science department at Cornell University. Welcome back. And then I have another uh, guest, Josh Jackman. It's a young rising star from the uh, food science and technology. He currently at SKKU. And uh, we're going to talk about general idea of uh, what is the future agriculture innovation is going. And uh, let's start the discussion uh, starting from Josh. OK, so uh, Dr. Boyd, Dr. Elrod, you know, thank you for joining us today. I know it's a, a little late in the schedule there, so we appreciate you participating. Um, you know, as Professor Cho mentioned, you know, uh, you know, your experience in agricultural innovation, you know, is really, you know, phenomenal. And, you know, you have a lot of experience, you know, across academic, uh, industry, you know, government and various forms. And, you know, I think one thing, you know, we can learn from you, Professor Cho, myself, you know, everyone in the audience, you know, kind of what are the trends? Where do you see things going and, and, and so forth? So I think, you know, Whoever would like to start, you know, maybe I could start with this one question and, and feel free to chime in. But you know, nowadays we see so many hot topics in food science and agriculture. You know, if I read the newspaper, I see things like artificial meat, you know, gene editing, CRISPR, um, African swine fever. And you know, when you kind of think about the near future, what what topics you know stand out to you as kind of the big issues, trends that you think people should really you know be paying attention to? I'll go ahead and start. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll speak from a uh, food agriculture perspective. And uh, my experience as noted is in pigs, which is uh, presently uh, the global meat of uh, choice. Um, there are several things that are particularly important uh, to us as a society, but especially important to us as food producers. One is animal disease. Uh, each country has its library of diseases and uh, some of these are recurring and some have vaccinations for. But as we've globalized, uh, we have transboundary diseases. And so the library of diseases that we fight in the animal industry has um, grown quite a bit. And so various methods uh, for controlling diseases are much needed. The second thing is somewhat related to it, but not completely, is viability. Uh, how well are our animals able to live? And for example, in the pig world, uh, from the time that a pig, uh, if, if we have 1 million pigs born, uh, about 185,000 of them will not make it to market. Uh, the collective death loss is 18.5%, we'll say. Now, there are solutions to both, but the, another hot topic is antibiotics. And I speak of that from the standpoint of having replacements for antimicrobials that are important to humans. So we shouldn't be using 
uh, essential antimicrobials in the pit in the animal world that are also going to be used in the human sector. And then I think you were wise to point out artif artificial meat. Um, this is in the industrialization uh, step of attempting to become um, more industrialized, produce quantities. But it's also important to note that to this point, um, much of what I understand is produced requires antimicrobials along the way. And so again, you're, if that's a worry uh, to you, then one has to look for natural food products uh, that may also uh, be effective against various organisms. So those are some that I think of disease, mortality, uh, artificial meat, and, and uh, displacing antibiotics that are important for the human sector. Dr. Elrod, do you have anything yeah. to um, add to Dr. Boyd's excellent kind of uh, uh, outline of some of the biggest issues? I could, couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I couldn't agree more either. Um, but I, I think as we look more broadly, uh, things like food security, for the growing population, if if we're going to be at seven billion people on this planet by by 2050, we really need to work harder to ensure food security. Uh, so part of that is you know reducing waste, reducing harvest loss. Uh, Dr. Boyd spoke to that in in terms of the 18.5% losses from birth to to uh, harvest of of pigs. Um, so food security, get, you know, sec getting all the food that we uh, start to grow in whatever form that might be to a market and then to consumers so that they have enough caloric and protein intake to survive and thrive. Another is food safety. And, and I think this is a really crucial area where there's a whole lot of uh, really neat innovation happening in terms of sensor technology and and picking up on pathogens and things like that, as well as the issues that Dr. Boyd addressed related to antimicrobial use, antimicrobial resistance and, and whatnot. And then the third is really uh, animal health as, as Dr. Boyd already uh, related. So I, I really won't add much to that, but uh, again, I think the broad topics of food security, food safety and animal health will all intertie into um, you know making uh, some some really hot areas for us to keep innovating and, and working on. No, oh, that's great. I couldn't agree more. But Dr. Boyd, you make it hard for us to uh, answer after you because, you know, I was reading one paper this morning just to prepare the bio even, um, where Professor Cho uh, nicely described. Uh, there was a recent article in Journal of Animal Science and Biotechnology, a letter to the editor, which I just sent you an email about. Um, but in order to correct one of the recent papers they published, they cited many of your works on pig nutrition um, as kind of the leading works in the field and, and how you're right and they're wrong. So, you know, I think uh, we have a lot to learn from you. <laughs> but uh, one thing is, you know, along those lines is, you know, we talk all the time about innovation in, in you know, animal science, agriculture. Uh, Professor Cho and I are, you know, engineers fundamentally are training uh, as professors, we think about innovation, in, in maybe a little bit sarcastically, but still in terms of publish or perish, you know, how many papers can we get out? What is the impact factor? Um, but half jokingly, but, but, you know, it is a priority for, you know, student education, outputs and so forth. Now, we have a lot of fundamental science questions. We can think about lipid molecules and, and you know, all the details. But when you're on the industry side, you know, innovation can mean different things. So, you know, you both had, you know, a lot of experience in, in terms of innovation in animal science, agriculture, um, you know, working in academia and in industry. But where do you see the kind of role of innovation or where is innovation kind of best suited to kind of help develop this field? And uh, how do you balance that fundamental, you know, scientific interest as a researcher um, with more practical industry uh, consideration sometime. You know, you're thinking sometime, you know, how do you balance those two hats? Or, or do you see you need to balance them or you see they go hand in hand? Or what are your kind of thoughts on innovation? Before we listen to answer, let me add one thing. 
one example and an audience is a science engineering professor, industry people and so on. And they're very exciting about this upcoming food science and technology regarding animal agriculture general in whole country, Asia, Singapore, China, Japan, in whole Asia country. However, if we actually see that the terminology we are talking about, for instance, engineering, nanotechnology, biotechnology, then nanobiotechnology, right? This is terminology. So Dr. Blackman just mentioned about innovation, but whenever I heard the people talking about innovation in agriculture or animal science, one thing seems to me is missing they not considering about the situation of current farmer and farmer industry. So when you comment this question, can you adding that too? Yeah, start with uh, uh, Dr. Dean, boy. Sure. Uh, I wanted to just uh, make note of one additional thing is uh, just prior to moving to this, um, sometimes we have research areas that are very fashionable and uh, the microbiome is one of them. Uh, but it, it's a topic that can be talked about and we can become very excited about. But in my opinion, until there is significant public and private monies that are being contributed to that, we're not going to be able to understand and harvest that. And once we do though, there, uh, the human animal health prospects are immense. The other thing is, um, since we have the Triumph Foods Group, we have to prove every day. And I want to emphasize something Charlie said in the last segment. We have to prove every day to our customers in North America, as well as in Asia, that the food we provide them is safe. And we have to have good, solid um, food science, chemistry tests to prove that. Now, with respect to innovation, uh, I'm not a sociologist, but I took one course in sociology. And so um, uh, one thing I learned from it uh, is about the area of innovation. And innovation in agriculture is essential to the life of our field of agriculture. And it's the sociology of this is interesting because um, where you have ownership, it's with only rare exception that people want to get better at what they do. I continue to be amazed at how people want to get better. They want to uh, do things more efficiently and that's a real gift. Now, so every field is innovating and refining their business practices. And, uh, if, uh, and, and if agriculture doesn't, we're going to be in big trouble. Now, I'll just make one comment. And I think Josh and Charlie, Dr. Elrod are very, um, would be very good at uh, the bridging uh, the fundamental science. Uh, I, I think that the fundamental sciences that are done at the university, at the institutes, and at uh, large um, companies that are not production companies, the science technique is so sophisticated and so deep that we cannot do that. Uh, we can actually typically do not know that in production companies. And so we have found that having a, uh, and we have routinely for 18 years had a link with several universities and now with uh, Dr. Charles Elrod's company where they understand the basic science. They have worked out some of the details, but, and, it's best if while they were doing that, they would talk to the people that they want to apply it to. And I'll give you an example of one group, one area that doesn't, and that's inefficient. But 
then they have to come and test the products in the sector in which the animals live. And that's an environment that you cannot create except out in uh, the field. And so we have found invaluable, very efficient relationships between the two. And our balance is, is if we don't have the two working together, we're out of balance. <laughs> That's all I can say about uh, balance. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Ellen. Hello, Charlie. Great. Well, well said, Dean. And and so that really, for me, and and I I had the good fortune to uh, take a certificate course at Cornell recently in innovation. So, you know, have some familiarity with current innovation, you know, thought. And, and really the thing that, one thing that was emphasized there is that innovation has to happen in order to resolve a problem. And, and so I think that does a lot towards uh, Dean's point of, you know, they in the production sector have a problem. Let's innovate to resolve that problem and create new solutions to that problem. And, and so, you know, we, we, we need to understand the context of, of the problem, the production system in which that problem is occurring. And, and that will certainly, it may constrain, but will make more realistic any potential solutions we, we come up with. So, uh, you know, really that combination of um, fundamental science and understanding of, of the very basic problem that's occurring in the field, you know, and, and whether that's a, you know, a pest issue out in a, a field crop or it's a disease issue, a viral issue uh, in a swine herd or cattle herd or whatever. Um, we need to start with that first rather than trying to, you know, find some solution and then apply it to a problem. And it gets to another point that Dr. Boyd made about kind of the perspectives of, of academic versus um, say commercial or industrial uh, research. And that is it in the academic setting, the, the desire and really the need is to take this reductionist point of view. So you try to isolate everything else except for the one reaction you want to describe or understand. But of course, those reactions don't ever exist in those conditions out, out in the wild, uh, you know, in a production system, in a field, uh, on a farm. So we really have to, you know, take that reductionist viewpoint, but then make sure and test it in that wild, kind of more integrative type of environment uh, where, where we can really understand whether it solves some problem or not. Okay, this is a fantastic comment, both of you, and then let me add uh, something and then ask him follow your question. And as you see the engineer right now, for example, in Asia, they put very specific area, for example, energy. Maybe you heard about flexible electron, which is they put tons of money, develop those technology as Boyd said, yeah, academia, we have to do the fancy science, whether it's applicable or not. But, you know, those areas is okay because in Asia, there is a company can support, for example, LG, Samsung. They can support and adopt those advanced technology. However, agriculture, essentially, I don't see any industry other than farming in Asian country. Not many. Very few gigantic conglomerate, they produce very fundamental material. For instance, if you're talking about the future farming, a lot of people just say automatically, oh, smart farming, we produce 30% more. Oh, drone, AI. So the, the, the government, without just thinking, they put automatically billions of dollars injection for those areas. So I want to ask you as an expert view, 
you know, there is definitely, even though I'm seen as a non-expert, there is a big gap between really fundamental agriculture and farmer with the what government directing put the tons of money for those fancy technology, what we call it. Yeah, we can write a paper for the AI tractor. We can write it for the uh, future farming or, or smart farming drone. They spraying the, uh, you know, pesticides and so on. So can you give us advice and comment for how we actually effectively distribute funding to help fundamental connecting to advanced science and technology? Whoever first come from Dr. Uh, Boyd, that, Dr. Dr. Elrod, would you like to tackle that one? <laughs> 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 I, I can make one yeah. while you're thinking, if you like. Uh, you raise a very good point. Uh, in food agriculture, the crop agriculture has done a much better job and was much earlier to put their crops into the field and to work with producers and find out that how well the crop works depends on the environment into which it's placed. Now, in animal agriculture, we've gotten to that point. Now, the other thing, though, is we see some engineering groups that work in what they call and we call smart farming technologies. And the things that they talk about and they show us are quite sophisticated, but I've been on the side of academia and uh, in out in the, the world, so to speak, and I marvel at how off the mark they often are. So if they wanted to use an optical scanning method to predict the weight of pigs so they knew which pigs to remove, to take to harvest, uh, they feel that they've got to get it within a certain error. Uh, and they say, I think we can get to 10 or 15% error. If they would have come to talk to us, we would tell them, if you're not under 5% error, you're not ready to go to market with some of the more sophisticated producers. And so, we have invited some of them to come out of the laboratory, come into our, our place where we have better facilities, we have better numbers, and we have smart people, PhDs, masters, that, and we have been able to uh, convince them that if they work directly with us, they'll understand the problem better and we'll solve it together, and then they'll have a customer, most likely, uh, without having to later convince them. They've helped us solve our own problems. So I think you raise a very good point, Dr. Cho, and that's a great example, smart farming, that is really needs to understand the inefficiency that uh, they're building into their own system. Right. And, and I agree that uh, with Dr. Cho that a lot of these new technologies, whether it's uh, you know gene editing or drones or artificial intelligence or microbiome work, they get so much attention. They're thought of as sexy. They're cool. They you know they draw lots of money, but those are really just they're just tools. They're not you know describing the microbiome is not the be all and end all. Describing it doesn't help us at all. You know, it's, it's only until we can then put it into application to solve some problem. So I may start to sound like a broken record here, but um, you know, these, we, we need to think about these things realistically that they're platforms or they're tools upon which we can build solutions to real time uh, problems or, or challenges that we face in animal agriculture or agriculture more broadly. Again, I. I have a bias. I, I have my animal science blinders on, but um, there, there again, I'd, I'd like to make a, another point, and that is 
that the cross fertilization of ideas, you know, our, our work with Dr. Jackman has just been really incredible because it's allowed for this cross fertilization of expertise and knowledge to come at, you know, our problems from a whole different perspective. And so that's another very key component is, you know, don't get so narrowly focused on one tool or one platform when there's a whole breadth of uh, adjoining knowledge and technology that may be applicable to resolving the issue you're trying to address. And that, that is a good point. I would say that the Dr. Elrod, who's a scientist in practice, but also connected with the university, Dr. Jackman, who's in a very sophisticated field of science in the university, and then several of us that have left the university to go into the field um, as we have worked together. And then as I have seen them then reach yet to a research institute in a completely different country, that's a marvelous example of efficiently uh, bringing solutions uh, to the table. There's other examples, but that's a perfect, perfect example. And one other thing about funding groups that always um, stunned me when I was at the university was you would have uh, federal grant uh, funding provided, and it's more efficiently determined these days in the US, it's better determined yet in Canada. Uh, you, you, would, you would wonder who made up that area of funding. And for example, we would spend a lot of time trying to um, save uh, animals from the blastocyst stage to right to the point of birth because there's so many lost. And yet our, the thing that they never considered was the fact once the pigs were born, you're losing 25% of what was born. And so I think where academics and industry personnel come together, decide on, on the most important areas, that's when you get the most, the best direction of, of funds. Dr. Jackman, any comment? No, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think you know, uh, Dr. Elrod really hit on uh, the point for working between academic and um, industry in terms of how we can combine uh, industry related problems with kind of uh, new cross dimensional uh, research approaches. So taking, for example, um, some of our research in you know, molecular chemistry of fatty acids and approaching this to solve problem with um, African swine fever, for example. Uh, so I think this kind of cross dimensional uh, research um, is, is very important. And along that lines, you know, I would like to ask uh, the next question, building on this. And I was thinking a bit more, maybe personal level, maybe Dr. Elrod could elaborate a little bit more and also Dr. Boyd bringing in additional experiences. Um, but in your opinions, you know, if you have a little bit more uh, description for the audience, uh, how can academic academia and industry, you know, work together um, to foster agricultural innovation? And especially, um, it would be really interesting to hear your critical insight, kind of maybe your personal experiences, uh, what has worked well and, and what you think could be improved based on your experiences. Maybe, you know, Dr. Boyd, as you mentioned, grant funding kind of structures or uh, Dr. Elrod, how you talk about, you know, kind of um, study planning or so forth in terms of, you know, combining different type of research disciplines, asking the right questions. Um, how have your personal experiences been in these kind of um, collaborations, practically speaking, and you know, where do you see uh, room for improvement? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm quite um, encouraged by even the fact that, you know, this conference, uh, the AKC conference we're, we're speaking at, on human health has invited two animal scientists to be, participate in a, in a panel. I, I think that providing conferences that provide more breadth 
to uh, the topics that they cover and the expertise don't get the same old speakers that have spoken at every other conference in the country in the last four years. You know, bring in some new perspective and viewpoint, but then allow for opportunities for that cross-fertilization of, of ideas. And that might be, you know, again, in the innovation culture, they talk about things like hackathons or a sandbox environment where interdisciplinary teams can get together to, to brainstorm and, and solve problems. And, and again, I think conferences like this where you, you know, invite that breadth of perspective uh, are just a great way to catalyze some of those conversations. I think the, you know, the, the society, our, our scientific societies, those meetings often have excellent representation from both industry and academia. And a lot of conversations get started. I remember uh, four or five years ago, uh, meeting with or talking to a, a young master's student at, one, at her poster presentation. We subsequently contracted with that lab to test some compounds that we had interest in this anti-inflammatory activity, for an example. That collaboration has actually grown into the, that professor trying to form an industry academia consortium to help explore kind of the biophysical properties and biological properties of these natural compounds. So I, I, I just think you have to have people with an open mind who are willing to look beyond what they know and, and open doors to, uh, to encourage conversation, critical uh, feedback and, and, you know, innovation. Fantastic. That's a fantastic comment, both of you. I just uh, 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 read a newspaper article uh, from uh, South Korea. The president, Moon Jae-in, just announced that, hey, future is agriculture. We need to build in this agriculture as a new deal for future city. Let me give you one example. The whole problem right now in, in most of the Asian country, the city, Every single one want to live in city. You, you visited maybe Beijing, Tokyo, Seoul. You know, one fourth of population mm -hmm. living in Seoul. This is more area. One fourth. So the problem is right now that the whole ruler city is collapsing because of that. And now this announcement, I'm hoping that they can revisit the importance of a fundamental animal science and agriculture innovation and so on. So the question is, how do you access, I mean, we looking for the America as a model system, United States as a model system. How do you access the current level of agricultural innovation in the United States? And what is the key achievement that other country can learn from, especially from Asia, learn from? And then what area can be improved? Start from uh, Dr. Boyd. Uh, the mic. Okay. Uh, I, I would say that the innovation in North America has been, uh, for the area of animal agriculture has been very good. And what hasn't been delivered on, at least, uh, the target that we have been working on was a good target. But um, I, I will say that um, there are several technologies that have come to bear. Now, I found that in some areas, the United States and or North America was a leader, but they were all, there were also other parts of the global community that were making good progress as well. But in the areas where North America has first brought things to bear is, for example, in gene editing uh, to tackle specific diseases for which after 15 to 25 years, we still do not have a vaccine for and so gene editing was something that was first 
um, it uh, perfected here, but it, it was being worked on simultaneously elsewhere. Uh, this, a sec and, and the second thing that has been known forever in the human world uh, since about 1913 is that one could use uh, samples such as saliva to do the testing of populations for disease. But with the wonderful era of the um, molecular chemical discoveries that have been made, we can use PCR methods to test populations for disease, and then we can put into place sensible biosecurity meth methods to keep the disease from spreading to other populations. The third thing that's been extremely good and was as known elsewhere, but put in place in North America, was genome typing for each newborn animal. We've assumed that uh, the animal, each animal is, has 50% representation from mother and 50% from father. On average, that's true. But in practice, each animal has a different proportion of genes and, and different genes from uh, one parent as compared to another. And so in North America, when little pigs are born, they are genotyped. And then because of the massive improvement in uh, computing capacity that's been discovered or been improved somewhere, I don't know, it's, uh, it's probably all over the world. You, Dr. Cho, you and Dr. Jackman would know. But without that technology, we couldn't apply those gene techniques. And then really to what areas that uh, Dr. Elrod and Dr. Jackman are working on, everybody has been talking about ways to improve health. And talk is cheap, but they have been able to, we've been able to show several things. That beta-glucans can be used, maybe not to replace antibiotics, but they make antibiotics expense more um, fruitful. Uh, viability has been improved with xylanase. And then the two doctors have amazing discoveries with natural lipid materials in terms of pathogen control. That uh, has its effects potentially to protecting feed that we feed our animals to the animals themselves, but wonder if that same technology could be used instead of antimicrobials for me artificial meat. So several wonderful things have happened primarily here, but I, I end as I always have with the most fruitful is where people are working it together across the earth. Yep. <clears throat> Great. Well, you know, so, so I think um, one of the key things that is happening here uh, is that young people are still interested in coming into agriculture. They still see fut a future in agriculture, and that may be in production, it may be in research, it may be in nutrition or service. And, and so that the vibrancy of our agricultural industries I think begets or draws in people um, to the industry in all kinds of roles with all kinds of expertise. I've, I've had the good fortune to travel the world uh, in the last 10 or 15 years. And one of the common concerns that I hear in agriculture is that there are no young people coming into it. And, and if you don't, if you're not attracting the young, the bright, the eager, the energetic uh, into the industry, you're not, it's not gonna be an industry that will innovate and grow and, and thrive. So I, I really think, uh, I, I mentioned to you, Dr. Cho, the uh, lecture I gave at Qingdao University a few years ago. And the question was, is there a future for students of animal science? Uh, and, and of course, it, from, from my perspective, it was a resounding yes. Uh, and 
you know, I, I, they were surprised because I, I polled some of my colleagues and asked, what are your, you know, your graduating senior uh, students, what kinds of jobs are they going to? What kinds of responsibility will they have? What kinds of salaries will they command? And I presented some of this uh, information and they were, the, the audience was astounded that, a, that somebody coming out of uh, an undergraduate program could go back to a dairy farm and earn $70,000 as a herdsman and within three or four years have earned enough equity to go off and launch their own dairy with three or 400 cows. And, and then the whole service sector, nutritionists, technicians, veterinarians to service those industries. So again, we have to make it kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy that there is value, there's, um, there's great merit to the opportunities in agriculture for young people. And then we'll see that, that innovation culture continue to thrive and grow. Could I add one thing there to what Dr. Elrod has said? That's, that's a very encouraging statement. Uh, in the early 90s, I heard uh, a scientist say that by the time we get to the 21st century, most of the people that will be in um, animal agriculture be coming into it will be people who uh, hadn't come from farms. And I, I found that uh, difficult to believe, but when I thought of farming, I thought of being at the farm doing the, all the laborious work. But when you think of how many people from professional sectors are required to support the farm, it's unbelievable. Uh, our CFO of our company of 90,000 sows is from Pittsburgh. He doesn't even live, he didn't even come uh, from a place that was near a farm. And uh, almost all of the young people that come in as veterinarians, etc., they love agriculture. Uh, they didn't know where uh, they would fit. And I will uh, try to be a prophet here and state that I think Dr. Josh Jackman will end up uh, receiving uh, meritorious honors for his contribution to animal science, um, viral defense. And uh, uh, I don't know if Dr. Jackman's from a farm or not, but the area he's in didn't strike me as being one that would make him interested in farming, but he's He's very interested in supporting uh, that area. So I think Dr. Elrod's comments are spot on. T 12 out of every 15 people we add to upper levels of our company and are in support companies, none of which have come from the farm. All, right, but all of which love the animals. Yeah, exactly. This is a fantastic comment. I have a, a 75 more question to go. But you know, due to the time <laughs> limitation, I just ask one more question, very important, one more question, and then uh, we need to finish this uh, you know, panel discussion. As you know, Asia is very successful along that line. Lots of innovation, success in IT, nanotechnology. Then they get into the, for example, Samsung Biologic. Samsung even put the effort to develop biotechnology, biologic, produce drug, and so on. Now, go back to the fundamental, a lot of people start talking about specific niche, food science and technology, agriculture, innovation. So do you have any recommendation about what type of uh, educational and policy efforts can be useful to support this agricultural innovation because there is no, I mean, we have a, a curriculum and education policy that is just very, very old. There is no innovation that, so that no one actually know. And then, you know, you mentioned about the Qingdao case, students have to ask to the professor or a policymaker, do we have a future if I do the agriculture? Okay, mm -hmm. tell me the uh, 
Dr. Eloy the Ordean. Dr. Elrod, may I give just a little perspective? Please. And would you directly answer Dr. Cho's very good question? <laughs> um, I, I have um, been sad to see so much progress made in uh, the IT area as compared to uh, food agriculture area. Um, and yet we have people who are very, very bright in food agriculture. Um, the public safety protocols that are needed for, and I say this so we can go into this with our eyes wide open, it, it, the public safety protocols for medicine and food animal agriculture or food agriculture are more difficult and, and um, difficult to meet in North America. <clears throat> if you go to gene edits in crops in North America, we found recently that some of those who are the molecular geneticists have taken pity upon those in the animal area who are doing gene edits because the crop gene edits uh, are regulated, but they're regulated in the USDA sector, which is for food. The animal is regulated in the FDA sector and treated as a medical um, uh, development. And so one has to go into it with the knowledge that it's going, we aren't going to make the progress, but we can make good progress. Now I will tell you, sometimes there's sadness. Uh, you can get something through and then the marketing people take over from one company and put a black mark on something that kills a product another company spent 15 years developing. A classic example is bovine somatotropin. That was a great accomplishment. But one company decided we're going to state that our product doesn't have, the cows don't receive bovine somatotropin as a marketing thing. So I didn't, this doesn't answer your question. I'm just giving you some perspective. You're back to Charlie's point that food security for a country is very important. You do not want to have to import every piece of food that you provide your people. Food independence of a country is a big deal. Medical manufacturing of a country in a country is a big deal. Certain things you must do. And that was the lesson that the United Kingdom learned during World War II. Uh, they did not have the ability to provide for themselves. So a little perspective. <laughs> Thank you very much. Over that, sir. So, so I... I believe the question was, you know, how do you, what policies, what, what can you implement to, to, to bring about a change? And again, I'll, I'll go back to the young people. You have to encourage them into the, the industry. And so I think from a policy standpoint, you would have to look at scholarship opportunities, um, stipends for graduate students, research dollars to support that, but make those private public partnerships where there is industry involvement and oversight even, or at least collaboration in terms of, you know, selection of, of students, uh, funding of scholarships for students, the, the emphasis placed on curriculum development, uh, all of those things can help foster this uh, an, an innovation, uh, culture of innovation, as well as bringing some level of excitement because all of these students, and I, and I traveled wild, widely over several years in China and vi visited lots and lots and lots of production units. One thing I rarely saw were middle managers, herds people, general managers that were local, that were Chinese locals. All of those people were imported and they were imported from New Zealand or the US or wherever who had had either undergraduate training or veterinary training. And, and so there was nobody from the, the Chinese system filling into those positions. So we have to you know, create the opportunity for 
people to see a future in agriculture and to get the training they need to fulfill those roles. You can still be an immunologist. You can still be a, a molecular biologist, but all of these things can be applied in, in agricultural settings. So just it's, it's creating awareness, it's creating the opportunities, uh, creating the policies and the funding structures that will you know, move the center of gravity toward agriculture to attract the best and the brightest. I, I will yeah. say one other thing, if you don't mind. One of the problems we faced at Cornell University was uh, was that when a person a person came to the to the field of animal science, and they had an interest in animals, but beyond maybe work uh, working with horses or um, uh, small animals or being a veterinarian, they didn't know what animals, what you can do in animal science. And so Cornell University did at that time, and I, they probably still do now. We felt that unless when our people came, they needed to know what kinds of things you can do in animal science. What kind of things can you do? Where are the jobs? How do you get there? And so pathways were formed so that if you're interested in physiology or if you're interested in a particular area of physiology or molecular uh, molecular side, uh, all of that, we felt we had to make certain that students had a chance to see clearly that there weren't just two or three things, there were 14 or 15 areas they could see educationally how they could get there and quite honestly, this is where full professors are uh, important because they have more freedom. They can do what they want. <laughs> but uh, you can help make certain that students go get internships uh, in the areas they think they want to study. And then a very famous professor in our department, Murray Elliott, put together a video and as he went across the country to various science fairs, et cetera, he showed a nice video that gave us, gave students a chance to see what can you do in animal science and how can Cornell University help you get to your goal? So vision is very important. The excitement's there, but there's no vision. And the problem is, <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with you. And let me ask the uh, uh, same question to the Jack, uh, Dr. Jackman. I mean, you're in the first line right now, recruit student, teach student, and do the research together regarding the relay with the animal agriculture and so on. Uh, how do you attract people? What, what do you say? You cannot just say, I will show you the money. <laughs> I tried that. It doesn't work. They don't believe me. <laughs> the, um, so maybe I can ask you uh, first, Dr. Cho, um, what context are you asking in general or for the agricultural and animal science perspective? Hey, for example, okay, let's, let's give you an example of my, my students. They look mm -hmm. at this mobile phone, oh, hey, it's a cool industry, I want to go to IT and the nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. Hey, flexible electronics. That's why every single one sends me email. I want to do the biosensor and hopefully flexible electronics. And happen to be, I want to be that biodegradable and so on. Yeah. Hey, let me use the pollen and so forth so on. But why they do that? They think it's cool. Potentially, they can make a lot of money, have a future, have a job. You know, the, the Dr. Illo just say about in the Qingdao talk, and then I was totally agree with you. Do we have a future in animal agriculture? Well, it's the reality. People think when you're thinking about agriculture, it's not cool. The the young mindset. So we need to convert. I mean, fundamentally, we need to convert something. So you're young, and then you're teaching your student, and then do the yeah. research. How, how do you attract people? So I think I can. I, I've learned from all three of you. I think in some sense. Um, but I I think in some sense I've copied all of you. But how I could say it is, frankly speaking, in Korea nowadays, uh, in order to recruit students, whether local or even international, 
Unfortunately, if you stick directly to the agricultural angle, it's very hard to recruit students for many of the reasons we discussed. My personal success has been uh, from attracting students to the biosensor strategy way. Um, nowadays, with the virus research based on you know, uh, that track record, people can see it because of COVID-19. So if I discuss biosensing with virus, Oh, COVID-19, I can save the world. You know, young <laughs> students are very idealistic in no sense, which, which is good. Um, but the issue right now in the area where I see it can be improved is if I extend that argument or I extend the information to, hey, what about African swine fever? This is actually as just you know, arguably as big of an impact on the global society. I mean, it's totally... Um, you know, dramatically impacted global food and feed markets. And, and it's, it's a huge issue, not only in China, where it's been major outbreaks, but a major concern in the U.S. nowadays uh, when it will happen. The research methods, the research strategies are almost very similar between, let's say, COVID-19 and African swine fever. They're both envelope viruses. But if I attack, uh, attract students that way or discuss this with students right now, uh, they don't see how can they participate in agricultural and food science research in Korea, for example? So I think right now is still focused on you know, the high impact topics that students understand today. But I think one thing we're working through a private, uh, public-private partnerships, as Dr. Elrod mentioned, or some of these policy angles that Dr. Boyd and yourself have mentioned, Dr. Cho, um, is very important. You know, how can we make agriculture in, in food science and animal science popular? I mean, if you look at, for example, in U.S., what is the largest privately held company? It's Cargill. It's essentially a food company. <laughs> I mean, these are the, you know, captains of industry. These companies are humongous. They drive the innovation. They drive the country growth, success. But if you actually see it from student perspective, they think the smartphone, uh, you know, version 10 over version 9 is what drives the country. But actually food is what drives countries. You know, you, as Dr. Boyd said, you need food independence, you need food innovation. Uh, these, these are critical aspects, you know, of food safety, food security, as Dr. Elrod mentioned. Um, but we need to better connect those topics with what students can understand, what they can see to really attract the best students to this area. And I see huge potential, huge need, uh, but I think we can do much better. Right, thank you very much for the all. And then really, really final question. I mean, I know it's a little bit more time, but I need, to ask, I need to ask this question. Have you ever guys visited Singapore or Korea? I have not. Okay, I will. I, I've not been to Singapore. I've been to Korea several times. Okay, so. I, will, I will send you a flight ticket tomorrow so you can fly in and then we okay. can discuss further. And then very soon, you know, very soon, after they remove the travel restriction, and then we definitely need to get together and then meet people. And then um, we, we need to make it something, you know, better for the world. And one question, Singapore is the size of, right now, population is about 5 million plus, half foreigner, 2.5, 3 million foreigners, 3 million Singaporean, for around 6 million. The size of Singapore is 70, 20, 725 kilometers square. This is the, you know, SI unit. What is the 725 kilometers square, Josh? Math. I don't know. It's a, it's a 30 minute drive across the island. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. It's not, not, not big. You know, it's a very packed. Yeah. Core agriculture innovation right now. Exactly. They think, hey, we need to do food security. Smart farming is the solution. Mm. And then when I see the engineering viewpoint, when I see the land and then calculate how much it costs, it's not even near, it's not even nearby. What is your suggestion in, in those people? If you, you, you see that those policy makers are making decide to doing such a thing, and then what is the alternative solution? It's a little bit hard question, but what is the alternative solution you can advise to? You know, I, I, I guess for you, you get secure in as much of your food system as you can. So if that's 
you know, vertical farming, hydroponics, um, you know, all of this, the, the finely tuned LED lighting and the humidity control, nutrient control, all of that, you know, you can pack a lot of food production into one hectare, you know, if you make it 30 stories tall. Um, so, you know, as much as you can create, you know, security around that one uh, technology, there will, of course, be gaps. You know, we, we will never grow coconuts, um, you know, here. We will never be secure in, in other food items here year round. But we've, we've all become spoiled because we want to eat asparagus or grapes or fresh lettuce every single day of the year. So we kind of expect this, um, you know, huge uh, variety of food every single day, but knowing what can be grown locally, what it makes sense to grow locally, what is adapted well locally, you know, focus on those things. But in a, in a highly urbanized setting, then, then your engineering and your technologies will, will really come into play. Mm -hmm. That, that is a wonderful question um, because Singapore is, is not going to be a major pork producer or chicken producer for Singapore, but you'd have to say that's an area where, as Dr. Elrod mentioned, uh, maybe targeting artificially produced meats that can be grown in short periods uh, of time and compact uh, facilities that's some, and other foods that makes a lot of sense for companies. So you say we have a library to choose from, but the library we choose for maybe number one emphasis for Singapore might be different than America or Canada. So that's, that's yeah, wonderful that's teaching. Point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is excellent comment, excellent talk, and then thank you very much. Right now, we are following the section of uh, 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 the, the panel discussion, uh, final of the AKC 2020 uh, Asia-Korea conference, and then so far, the, you know, this is a fantastic uh, event, and the, as well as this is the very high-level discussion. I'm very thank you much to the uh, Dr. Uh, Boyd, and then also Dr. Elroy uh, from the corner in New York to uh, joining camp, joining to this uh, special session. And also very thanks to the Dr. Jackman from Korea to joining very early hour. Of course, Singapore is finished right now. <laughs> you beat and us here now. Really so it's okay. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you very much. And then I'm looking forward to uh, discussing further this topic with you guys in the very, very near moment. Okay. Thank, thank you very you so much. much. Thank okay, you very thank much you for the opportunity. Yeah. Take care. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye.